So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, a novel use of machine learning um, as a tool for pure mathematicians. Yeah, how you can use machine learning to discover new connections in mathematics and to um, help formulate new mathematical conjectures. And most of this is joint work with uh, Alex Davies, Andras Uhash, and Nenad Tomasev. So Alex and Nenad are at DeepMind, and Andras is my colleague at Oxford. So <clears throat> the machine learning that we used um, was very straightforward machine learning. Okay, so uh, Jordi <clears throat> yesterday talked about um, uh, several different aspects of machine learning and said how important it was to use uh, the right architecture, be it transformers or what have you. This is really, really simple. So from the machine learning point of view, this is uh, unexceptional stuff. So <clears throat> we just used straightforward supervised learning. Uh, Jordi already told us a little bit about what that was. I'm just going to retread that ground because it's, it's uh, uh, important that everyone's on the same page with this. So the setup is you've got um, some function f, which goes from some subset s of rn to rk. And you suppose that you can compute it, but you don't know exactly what it is explicitly. And um, you're given various data points in v in your subset s, um, as well as their images under f, f of v. And <clears throat> what the machine learning algorithms give you uh, uh, is a function capital F going from Rn to Rk that is an approximation to little f, um, at least at uh, the given data points. So I just think of this as uh, nonlinear regression. Right? So linear regression is exactly this. Um, where the output function is just some affine function. Um, this is giving you more interesting, more complicated functions, f. And, um, but there are some differences from linear regression. One of the most important ones is that you don't get an explicit output function, f. It's just something that's computed by your neural net um, and uh, so there's no real way that you could say that this is in any way understandable. Unlike the case of linear regression, which gives you a specific linear formula, all you get is the ability really to compute capital F at other inputs W. Um, also, unlike linear regression, you get no guarantee that this is the best possible F. Of course, that doesn't really make any sense. What, what do you mean by explicit? I mean, if you have the ability to compute it, then that's pretty explicit. <laughs> well, that's why I put it in inverted commas. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense in the sense that, yes, you can compute it. You could take apart your neural net and work out exactly what it was, but I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> You've got a formula for it on floats, but not a formula on reels. Yeah. What? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Every every real it's all evaluated with reals and theory. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's what supervised learning is, and uh, Jordi gave an example uh, yesterday. Here's a pretty similar example um, where, which you can really do at home. Um, you can. Um, uh, train a neural network to tell the difference between a dog and a cat. Right? So the setup is uh, uh, R, N is the number of pixels of an input picture, and it's just for the sake of argument, say all input pictures have the same number of pixels. And uh, obviously, then a, a picture in grayscale, these aren't in grayscale, gives you an element of Rn. Um, and um, the function little f is uh, minus one if it's a picture of a cat, one if it's a picture of a dog, and say zero otherwise. Do you ever run it? Do you ever get the output zero in practice? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't know. So it's not undefined. It really is zero. 
No, the output function, well, the output function capital F is, um, is, is always defined. Um, the input function, um, you could, if you wanted to, uh, instead of giving it pictures of dogs and cats, also give it just pictures of anything you wanted and then just say that was zero and it would hopefully try to learn that. So um, this is called supervised learning because some poor person has to go through and say, this is a picture of a cat, this is a picture of a dog, etc., etc. So you're giving, you know, that th th it requires human input in some sense. Well, that, yeah, by the way, when you do your little capture thing, yeah, that's, when, you know, that's what you're doing. You're identifying pictures of buses. It's getting fed into something like this <laughs> uh, so that it's learning what pictures of buses look like. <clears throat> okay, so that's what um, supervised learning is. And um, so uh, we use supervised learning to um, uh, tell us some new information in not theory, right? So this is really just going to be, uh, you know, an extend. Most of the rest of this talk is going to be in an extended case study of, of uh, how you can use supervised learning um, and how we did it in not theory. So not theory, not uh, just um, smoothly embedded simple closed curves in three space. There's a really rich theory of them now. Um, uh, the goal is to say, well, there are many different goals of not theory, but one might want to say, for example, classify knots to decide be able to decide whether two knots are the same. Um, and knot theory is quite a well-connected subject. It connects to many other different areas of mathematics. Um, and as a result, there are many different branches of knot theory which connect to different other areas of mathematics. So for example, there's hyperbolic knot theory, which is really my area, which is focused on non-Euclidean geometry. And I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in hyperbolic knot theory in a bit. <clears throat> there are, there's a gauge and Fleur theoretic invariants, which use some pretty serious differential geometry. So, you know, say going back to uh, instantons, um, in work of Donaldson, where you're looking at uh, flat SU2 connections. Uh, but now there's a very rich uh, uh, collection of, of gauge and theoretic, gauge and Fleur theoretic invariants of knots. And there's also quantum topology, um, which where the prototypical example of a quantum invariant is, is the Jones polynomial. Okay, so Jones in the mid 80s defines this very strange, still poorly understood polynomial um, that uh, you can attach to any knot. And there are now, <coughs> that was then reinterpreted by Witten uh, as uh, defined the quantum SU2 invariants. And um, there are now a whole host of different other um, uh, uh, not invariants in the world of quantum topology. So these different three different areas, they're very distinct. Um, there are some connections that are known between uh, the second and the third area. So in particular, um, groundbreaking work of Kronheimer and Rofka established a connection between these two areas. Um, uh, they show that there's a, a connection between so-called Kovanoff homology, which is a refinement of the Jones polynomial, and uh, instanton homology. Um, and they were able to use that, for example, to prove that Kovanoff homology uh, is an unknot detector. So you tend to get interesting results when you can get these different areas. But the first area particularly is very poorly connected to the other two. So let me just sort of illustrate this by uh, giving um, the speaker lists of two conferences that happened last summer. Okay, so there was uh, Alan Reed's uh, conference, uh, which happened in Texas. Uh, so Alan is a hyperbolic geometer. And then about a month later, there was a conference in Trieste. And uh, the topics there, you can see, I took this from the webpage, uh, interplay of three-dimensional and four-dimensional topology Fleur homology theories and associated invariants, Kovanoff homology, and geometric and analytic aspects of gauge theoretic equations. So the thing to take from this list is that these two sets of mathematicians are disjoint. Okay? There is no overlap at all. Well, were, they the, were they at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> 
I would be cheating. No, they're a month apart. They're a month apart. A bit over a month apart. So you could easily get from one to the other. Um, so, um, so yeah, the goal was to try to connect these two different areas so that we could have nice harmonious conferences all together. Um, but also, more importantly, it tends to be that if, if, if you establish a connection from one area to another, then you can use information you know about one field to pass it over to the other. OK, so as I say, the goal was to find connections between these fields. And we looked at the various different invariants, the not invariants, that were attached to the fields. So in the hyperbolic side, hyperbolic structures, as I say, I'll tell you more about them later, but that's where you <clears throat> drill out your knot and you look at the knot complement, which is a three manifold, and you put a Riemannian metric, a special type of Riemannian metric on that knot complement. So <clears throat> yeah, there are many of the invariants that you can attach to a hyperbolic structure are Riemannian variants. So for example, the volume of that metric or the length spectrum, that's the length of the geodesics and, and also how they twist as you go along them. Um, so-called cusp shape and volume, and I'll tell you more about that later. But there's a whole list of invariants that you can uh, attach to a hyperbolic structure. And then on the other side, um, uh, there's uh, sort of Higard Fleur homology, Instanton Fleur homology, and the long list of mostly Greek letters, S, Tau, Epsilon, Upsilon, etc., etc., which are um, uh, attached to these areas. Um, and I call them three slash four dimensional invariants because the things on this side, um, they ha definitely have connections to dimension four. Okay, so um, these gauge theoretic invariants, they're at least they're as much four dimensional invariants as they are three dimensional invariants. Um, whereas the things on this side, the hyperbolic structures, really have very little known connection to dimension four. So the actual invariant that we looked at on this side was the knot signature, and I'll define that shortly. Um, it's a, a classical invariant defined over 50 years ago. Um, it's just an, a number, an integer that you can attach to a knot. Um, but it definitely lives on this side. It's a three slash four dimensional invariant. And it turns out to be highly correlated with uh, many of these quantities here as well. So the goal was, in fact, we said, well, can we find a connection between these quantities here and the signature? Right. You could ask the same question about any one of these quantities on this side and the ones over here, or vice versa. This is extremely general. OK, so let me just tell you what the signature is, just a little aside. It's a, <coughs> Quite a simple invariant. Um, so what you do is you start off with your knot in three space, and you uh, pick a Seifert surface for it. So a Seifert surface is a compact oriented surface with boundary embedded in three space, whose boundary is the knot. Okay. So for example, uh, here's a surface sitting inside three space. couple of twists in here. <clears throat> OK, so this is a, a surface sitting inside three-dimensional space. I've taken a little rectangle at the bottom, and I've add, added on to twisted bands to it. And the boundary of that is a knot. And I'm not sure it's either the figure eight or the trefoil knot. I'm not sure which. Okay, so every knot has a Seifert surface. And then attached to that Seifert surface S, there's um, a uh, so-called uh, symmetrized Seifert form, which is a bilinear form on the first homology of that surface. So it takes as input two elements of the first homology and outputs an integer. So you just represent these two elements of first homology just by loops, L1 and L2, on your surface. And then you form L2+, plus, which is you just 
push off L2 in the transverse direction to the surface. And uh, that forms L2 plus. And so you look then, first of all, at the linking number between L1 and L2 plus, because now L2 plus has been pushed off the surface, so it's been dis it's disjoint from L1. So you just look at the first of these terms, this is called the Seifert form, and it's used to define, for example, the Alexander polynomial. In this game, though, we form the symmetrized Seifert form, where you interchange the role of L1 and L2, and you form this symmetric bilinear form, and then you can just look at the signature of that symmetric bilinear form, and this turns out to be independent of the choices that you made, right? the choice of Seifert surface that you made. So that's the knot signature. It's a very nice invariant and has lots of nice properties. And here's how it relates to dimension four. So in this world, <coughs> you, uh, you have your knot sitting inside R3, and you think of R3 as the boundary of upper half space in R4. So you think of it as the boundary of R4 plus. And then you consider, unlike in this case where we're thinking about surfaces sitting inside three space that the knot bounds, you think about a surface sitting inside R4 plus that the knot bounds. And you can then define the four ball genus of the knot to be the smallest possible genus of such a surface. So this quantity is zero exactly when the knot bounds a disk in R4 plus. Yeah, okay. Uh, I put in brackets, I didn't want to say. Uh, it's, uh, you could, let's, there are two different versions of four ball genus, uh, depending on the category that you're working in. So the simplest thing would be just to say smoothly embedded. It turns out that best to say topologically locally flat in this particular setting, which means that it's topologically embedded but it has uh, a little regular neighborhood, which is a, a disk bundle over the surface. Well, yeah, it does. So, so <clears throat> if I hadn't put this condition in here, then the answer would always be zero, because what I could just do is I could just view this as the, bo the boundary of the four ball and just cone off to the central origin point. But then that central origin point would not be locally flat. Um, or I could say I'm going to look at smoothly embedded surfaces, and then it turns out you get a different answer. And this is one of the real things why four-dimensional topology and geometry is, is hard. Um, so one thing that turns out is possible for this number to be zero, um, even when the knot is, is, is a non-trivial knot. So here this is actually a connected sum of a trefoil and its reflection, and this turns out to bound a, a disk in four space. And this is, for, in the low dimensional topology, whether or not a, a, a knot bounds a disk in four space is really important. In fact, like the heart of Friedman's proof of the four dimensional Poincare conjecture was essentially proving that certain knots in three space bound disks in four space. Okay, so this is right at the heart of four dimensional topology. And the signature provides information about this. So Murasugi proved that the four ball genus of the knot is at least um, half the absolute value of the signature. So if your knot happens to have non-zero signature, then that means it definitely does not bound a disk in four space. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on, on the signature, but I just wanted to explain it to you. So these are, you know, so that it kind of brings to light what, what the, uh, some of these quantities are. Okay, so the goal we set ourselves was, remember, we had these invariants on one side, these so-called hyperbolic invariants, which I'll go through in a bit. And the question was, can we predict the signature from them? So at the moment, before this, there was, there was, there was no known connection between these two areas. But... You can phrase this in the same, you know, in the setup of supervised learning, asking, is there some function f which takes as its input the hyperbolic knot invariance of a knot? And they're mostly just real numbers. So you just think of them as living inside some Rn. N is some 
I don't know, 30, we were sort of looking at, we looked at a list of a whole different collection of knot invariants. And asking, is there some function to the reals that outputs the knot signature? Maybe not exactly on the nose, maybe a good approximation to it. Okay, so we used machine learning to see whether we could, whether this question was likely to have a positive answer. So what you have to do with machine learning is you have to come up with these data points V. So each one is a, is a knot. And you need to compute a huge list of invariants for it. Unfortunately, there's this wonderful program called Snappy, uh, which um, does this for you. It's really remarkable. You draw a little picture of a knot, or you input it in some other way, and it just computes a whole load of stuff for you in really nice form. <coughs> Doesn't matter. All of this, yeah, all of this is, it, it is like super dirty. You really don't need, doesn't need to be precise. I mean, obviously you'd like it to be, but it's, but, but, but. So <clears throat> we created a sample set of uh, 2.7 million hyperbolic knots. Um, so it was composed of <clears throat> two different types of knots, complete list of all knots with at most 16 crossings. So other people had already created such a list. Um, and uh, you could, we could just plug it straight in. Together with <coughs> one million randomly no chosen knots with um, at most 80 crossings. So Snappy has this um, really cool function um, where you can just ask it to create a random knot. And <coughs> it's based on the theory of quadrangulations of the sphere, it's very nice, emerging area of, of, of probability theory. Um, but <clears throat> just for our purposes, it just creates lots and lots of different knots. Okay? And um, the, you might wonder, like, uh, what do I mean by randomly chosen? Well, it does create, it, there is a good sense in which it's randomly chosen. But I'm going to come to this actually later, that actually the choice of data set that you put into this is really important. And just having something random is not necessarily what you want. Yeah. Sorry, is this the same software program like Snap-P, the low dimensional topology thing, or is this a different yeah. package? No, this is snap -y. yeah. Okay, I think it's just a typo on the slide that was Ah, no. It <laughs> used to be called with an Oh, did they, oh, they changed the name? But okay. they changed the name when they converted it to Python. Ah, great, thank you. That's why I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. yeah. Silly, silly. Yeah. Actually, it was pretty useful because before you had to like input the knot by hand, each time, which is kind of annoying, is 2.7 million. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas now you can just run, batch run it using Python. Thank you. Okay, so then you do um, uh, what you do in machine learning. You d divide it into this randomly into a training set and a test set, and um, you uh, train the neural network to try to predict the signature from the hyperbolic invariance, and then you then use the test set to see how good you've done. Okay, so there's no guarantee that this was going to work. This is the really important thing, right? No matter how clever your machine learning algorithms, no matter how brilliant your collaborators are at setting them up, and that if there is no connection between the signature and the hyperbolic invariance, this will give you garbage, right? <laughs> But yeah. Can I ask a naive question for an anthropologist? Yeah. Would the knot invariants you're using be enough to specify the knot? I mean, are they, like, could it be actually learning what the knot is, or are they not enough? Right. A good question. So um, the, um, uh, the hyperbolic structure is a complete invariant, but you don't feed that whole thing in. You create, look what at things like. What is the hyperbolic structure? What, what mathematical object? Well, I'm going to define it later. I'll give it to you later, but it's a, it's a Riemannian metric of constant negative curvature on the knot complement. Um, but you don't feed, that's not the list of invariants we fed in. So we things like fed like volume and length spectrum and things okay. like that. Now, this turns out to be a very good list of invariants and with, in particular, no repetitions in our set. Right, but then, so, in principle, there is a connection. I mean, in some sense, if it's pinning down which knot it is, then in principle, there's yeah, there's there is some connection. Then it's solving it even more. It might be illegible. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, 
That, that, that is absolutely right. Uh, uh, but I think it's really important to distinguish between in principle and what's actually happening. Right? Um, you know, it, as a mathematician, it's not to say, yes, there is some function little f. But, what, but the point is that if your, if your network can detect it, then chances are there's actually something else going on rather than just one determines the other. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, um, yeah, I, I, I take your point that, like, in principle, uh, because these were all different here, then, yeah, there is some function little f, but the fact that the network can find it says that actually something's going on. Yeah? I mean, at the risk of pushing a little harder on this, like, uh, the, the list of speakers that you, you put up were disjoint, but many of them had the same advisor. So, like, you have a situation where there's two different schools with two different preferred methodologies. Like, one school really loves PDE as a way of doing geometry. One school really loves, like, combinatorial group theory. Studying very similar phenomena, like, you'd expect there to be maybe some dimly understood Rosetta Stone really only known to sort of experts. But, I mean, I'm assuming that going into this, you had a high degree of confidence that there should be a strong underlying relationship between them and that this might be a bit of a fast way to do it rather than just trying to read both papers are somehow owned by both schools in your head. Um, no, I, 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 okay, so for a start, the, 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 there aren't too many shared advisors there. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I've been working in this area for quite a long time. I, I really didn't know whether the answer to this would be yes or not, that there is a connection. So, and I don't think other people expected it either. Anyway, the punchline is that, yes, the network could predict the signature. Right? So therefore, we knew something was going on. Right? The machine learning had told us something that we didn't know before. But then the problem is, OK, it's told you that. And then like, what, what do you do next? Right, so you would like to know, like, what is the connection between the hyperbolic invariance and the signature? And the problem is that the machine learning algorithms, they don't tell you. They don't give you this explicit f. And you know, you're just, you, you don't want to go back to the network. So you want to somehow interrogate the network in some way. And there, it turns out there is a, is a sort of rather naive but nonetheless useful way of interrogating your uh, neural network is to give you some information about the function f. And that is, you can ask it, what are the main invariants it's using in capital F? And so really what it's do, it does is it takes your input vector v, and it just wiggles them a little bit, uh, and, and, and sees as you vary v, well, as soon as, soon as you're varying v, one thing it's worth saying is that these invariants, they're, they're not independent. They're, 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 they are obviously correlated with each other in extremely hard to understand ways. So as soon as you move away from a real life knot, you're moving to something that probably does not exist. It's not actually the a quantity, a vector associated with a real knot. But nonetheless, you can see what capital F is using as its main input features. You, you wiggle the, the, the input vectors and see how that affects the output. And you get an output like this. And the top three, like they definitely win here. Um, and they are all of the same flavor. Right? So they, I, as soon as I looked at this, I was like, whoa, these three, the ima imaginary and real parts of meridional translation and longitudinal translation, they all relate to the so-called cusp shape. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that is in a bit. So I was like, wow, the cusp shape seems to be completely encoding the signature. And that was something that I was really surprised about. OK, we'll come back to this picture later. Now I want to tell you a little bit about, I bear promise this, I promise you, what, what is a hyperbolic structure? So a hyperbolic structure on a knot complement is a complete finite volume Riemannian metric of constant negative curvature. Okay? So what that means is it's locally isometric to hyperbolic space. And Mostow rigidity says that if such a metric exists, then in fact it's unique. And so that means that geometric invariants, such as volume, really are just topological invariants. And then Thurston proved that basically almost every knot has a hyperbolic structure. So you take any non-trivial knot K, you look at its complement in the three-sphere, and it says that it has a hyperbolic structure if and only if the knot is not a torus knot. So a torus knot is one that... <coughs> lies on the standardly embedded torus. 
just determined by two parameters, P and Q, which just tell you how many times it ran, winds around in the longitude and original direction. And you also mustn't be a satellite knot. So a satellite knot is defined as follows. You take a non-trivial knot, in this case the trefoil, you thicken it up to form a solid torus, and then you draw your new knot in there. And then the, the, the rule is you, the new knot that you draw mustn't live inside a three ball inside that solid torus, and it mustn't be a core curve of that solid torus, which would just give you the trefoil back. So if you can build it that way, then it's called a satellite knot. And uh, Thurston, this is basically what he got his Fields Medal for, was uh, proving that, that you can always find this hyperbolic structure as long as you don't have those two, um, as long as you're neither of these two. So for sort of in some sense for generic knots, they're hyperbolic. Okay, and um, so as I said, these three quantities, um, which, uh, which seem to be mostly controlling the signature, um, they um, are uh, defining the, the shape of the, the cusp. So what we've done is we've taken our knot and we've drilled it out. Right? So you're dealing with a non-compact three manifold. And that, that has an end, which is just of the form torus, which just runs along the knot, cross half open interval. Okay? So any knot complement, oops, has an end of the form torus cross half open interval. But when the knot's hyperbolic, then that has a, this canonical geometry, uh, and that makes it a cusp. So <clears throat> what is this geometry? Uh, you work with the upper half space model for hyperbolic three space. You look at all, so that's, you look at all points here with uh, x, y, z coordinates where z is greater than or equal to one. And so that's uh, foliated by these horizontal Euclidean planes, which are actually inherit a Euclidean metric. Um, and then you have some Z plus Z group of uh, Euclidean uh, translations, which acts discreetly on this, and you quotient out by that Z plus Z subgroup. And a fundamental domain for that action is just given by parallelogram cross half open interval. Okay? And that then forms, when, when you glue up, that forms torus cross half open interval. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the geometry that the, the end of your manifold inherits. And so <clears throat> this, you, what we normally look is what's called so-called maximal cusp. So imagine trying to push this down into the manifold as far as you can. And at some point it'll bump into itself uh, in, the th in the three manifold. And at that point, that's what's called a maximal cusp. So the boundary of that maximal cusp cusp is a Euclidean torus. And Euclidean tori can just be specified by a few, well, three real valued parameters. And that's what these three real valued parameters were that we were using to determine the signature. So the boundary of the cusp is a, say, Euclidean torus, which you can think of as just the complex plane modulo um, the, uh, a lattice, capital lambda, and you can just rotate that round so that, so that the longitude is, uh, um, uh, is real. Right? So, so, so this is, this is a, a, a torus which is just enclosing the knot. Right? And so there are two natural simple closed curves on that torus. There's a meridian which just surrounds the knot like that. And there's a longitude which runs along the knot and has zero linking number with it. Okay, so <clears throat> this uh, this parallelogram has sides which, where, where one corresponds to a longitude and the other one corresponds to a meridian. And you just rotate things around so the longitude is, is, is a real number and, and the mu is a, a, a complex number with positive imaginary part. Right, so you could actually just get this data from Snappy. Right, this is an actual output from Snappy. And like, you actually get this little parallelogram like this. And lots of all this other cool stuff with like, these things are here, which I won't go into, but there's, there's a lot of data, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the meridian's canonical and the other one's only up to it. Okay, so the longitude, yeah, so the longitude, a curve that runs at once along the solid torus, you're right, is not well defined, but there's a unique one that has zero linking number with a knot, and that's the longitude. 
So for example, for the not 6, 1, this is the output. And can I change mu by a, can I add lambda to mu? Well, if you did, you would get the same lattice, but there are canonical generators for the lattice, which are given by these slopes on the torus, which are the meridian and the longitude. Okay, so the torus is defined by three numbers, lambda, which is a positive real, and mu, which is a complex number, which has, you can think of as real and imaginary parts. And those were the three numbers which were determining the signature. Okay, so now we look, 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 we've got these three numbers. We want to see they're determining the signature. Now we want to see how. Now at this point, we don't use machine learning. We just use sort of good old-fashioned detective work, and you start plotting some points. Right? So it'd be great if we could use machine learning, you know, at least machines, to somehow tell us what's going on here. But at this point, we had to use... But you already used to like, figure out which low-dimensional plot to make here. Yeah, right, exactly. We wouldn't, have known how to, we wouldn't have known that one should be doing this. And, and then, like, how to focus on just three quantities. It's a huge difference from the 30 quantities that we had before. Yeah. Okay, so we plotted this. Uh, this was a cool picture, which I, I liked. Each one of these data points is a, is a knot. And on this side, we've got meridional translation. On this, we've got signature. And just for a bit of extra thing, we colored by lambda. So that, that's, that's not the, comp that's just two of the three variables, but it shows you that something's going on. And <clears throat> one thing you see from this is that this is not some random scatter point plot, right? You know, there's definitely structure. And <clears throat> one thing you say is, well, look, I don't quite know what the structure is, but one thing you can definitely say is that when meridional real translation is positive, the signature tends to be positive, and when it's negative, the signature tends to be negative. And so that original translation, that's whether or not this parallelogram is skewed to the right or to the left. So what we want to thought, well, like how skewed is that parallelogram? We want to sort of somehow distill this as some measure of the skewness of this parallelogram. And what we came up with was um, so-called natural slope. <clears throat> so I say this torus, what it's doing is it's enclosing your knot. And this is the meridian, and the longitude is running along here and has zero linking number with this. So the way we define the natural slope was you take your meridian, pick a point on it, and fire a geodesic orthogonally, call that mu perp, and it'll run along this torus and it'll eventually come back and hit this uh, meridian at some point, not necessarily where you started from. And as it does so, it's running along the longitude of the knot plus some number of meridians. And that number is what we'll call S. It's not necessarily a whole number because it doesn't necessarily start where it ends. That, well, minus that is the natural slope. And you could just encode it, just do a little bit of Euclidean geometry, and it turns out to be the real part of lambda divided by mu. So the point is that if this was a, if this was a rectangular parallelogram, a rectangle, then when we fired off mu perp, we would run exactly along the longitude, and so this number s would be zero. So this is somehow measuring the skewness of this parallelogram. Seemed like a good measure to look at. So we just now plotted that against signature. And this is what we got. It's, it's basically, it looks like a straight line. I mean, you know, with some error. But the slope is on the x-axis and the signature is on the y-axis. And we're like, wow, that looks pretty convincing. So we say, OK, now we can formulate this as a conjecture that maybe there's a constant c naught, so the signature is roughly c naught times the slope. And as I tell my undergraduates, this is not well defined as a concept. So um, <laughs> let's formulate this a little bit more precisely, that, that there are constants c naught and c1, so that the signature minus c naught times the slope, well, it has error. And, and it's difficult to know exactly what the right error to put in here is, error bound. But a natural measure of the size of the knot is the volume of the knot. 
This is, and so it seems that uh, this would uh, be a natural thing. Well, we then ran it against the data, and uh, this was yeah, 2.7 million. Uh, uh, were like, well, okay. So you can't. This is not a conjecture that you can just test from data. It's one thing it's saying because, like, you can always choose your C naught and C one to make this true, right? But nonetheless, like, uh, you know, the data was strongly supporting this, and in fact, strongly supporting an error bound that was like square root of the volume. Um, and uh, so this seems, ah, we were so sure this was true. And like, we really, I spent uh, ages trying to prove it. Um, and after a while, I started to think, well, maybe, maybe it's not. And so I started looking at a different data set. I started looking at braids. I'll talk a little bit about braids in a bit. And it wasn't looking quite so good for that data set. And then I thought, well, hang on, what's going on here? And I, I realized that actually this wasn't true. OK, so, um, uh, the, uh, okay, so this, here's a long theorem, which I don't really want to go into. But basically what you do is you, you, you form knots by taking some sort of template for them. So stuff going on down here, stuff going up here. There may be this more interesting stuff like the, oh, yeah. And then you add in Q1 full twists here and Q2 full twists here. And then you get rid of these two curves. Okay. So this is a like, very specific construction, but it made sense to do this because it turns out that it's known that if you, if you do this, you, then no matter what Q1s and Q2s you put in, the resulting things have bounded volume. So we would know that the error bound was, was bounded for these. But the way that the slope and the signature were behaving was just a little bit different, just enough to be able to say there couldn't possibly be this linear relationship. Anyway, so we're like pretty depressed at this point. Um, but fortunately, this gave us enough of a, a guide as to what the right conjecture should be. Like, what happens, it's known, for example, that under these circumstances, the injectivity radius of your, of your manifold starts getting small. And so it seemed to make sense to bring that in. And so we eventually came up with the theorems that says that, um, that signature is basically half the slope but with an error bound, which isn't quite what we had before. It's a constant times by the volume of the knot complement times by the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. Was one half what you thought the C naught was originally? Yeah, from right. So initially, yeah, so we, we got it pinned down to, to what, what, in fact, so what I, what I spent some time trying to prove using this sort of method was that if it was, if it was going to be anything, it was going to be a half. Yeah, ah, okay. <clears throat> anyway, so then, uh, yeah, there's another theorem which is a bit more precise, uh, which says that some, the signature and half the slope plus a correction term to do with short geodesics, which I won't go into, that gives you a, a, a better approximation. Okay, so those are the theorems, that's the story. It was, uh, it went from, um, uh, you know, hoping there might be some connection Machine learning suggesting there was a connection between these different areas. Then the saliency analysis showing what the, the, the main features controlling signature were. Then a bit of detective work, some emotional highs and lows, well, lows then highs, uh, and finally a theorem which, which, which proved the resulting thing. Because the, the, the volume injectivity radius scored very low on your saliency analysis. Yeah, well, it's an error. It's an error. It's not saying that the, so it's, yeah, well, hmm, okay. Yeah, so it's a good point, though. Are they not four, I thought, they are high up somewhere, though, aren't they? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, in fact, this is going to be my next slide, is that this more refined theorem says, like, says that actually, like, the three quantities that go into slope uh, are the, coming from the cusp. 
But then there's this extra thing which seems to be coming in, and that oops, is here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the machine knew all along. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's kind of impressive that actually. But is it also true that things with very small injectivity radius were rare in the data set? Like it might not yes. have picked up on that because it might have been, That's oh, there's these screwy examples that, I mean, that, that should always be thought of as a danger, right? That's exactly right. So getting... Crucial to make this method work is, is actually not just to pick random stuff, is to try to pick a genuinely diverse data set. Because we're trying to prove something is true for all knots, or all hyperbolic knots. Yeah, so, uh, so this is, uh, di let's just look at some difficulties with the method. So finding a, although the machine learning is useful, actually to go uh, to find a, a formula for F currently requires human input. Um, I actually think this is really interesting. You know, there's no reason necessarily why a computer shouldn't be able to come up with what it thinks is a good guess. Once you've pinned down, say, three main variables you want to use, try to come up with a, a good formula. Um, but at the moment, uh, the methods, uh, well, we, 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 we couldn't get any good methods to do that. I think other people are working on what's so-called symbolic regression. Another thing is this works best when you have inputs or, or, or well, when you have, yeah, invariants that are real numbers. They can be yes or no type real numbers, right? You know, dog or cat. Um, but like, you know, how would I encode, say, a polynomial in this? Or, I don't know, um, a Kobnoff homology, homology or a, I don't know. I, I think of any, any of your favorite mathematical quantities, some are more amenable to this sort of observable, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. Anyway, it, you, you can try to, yeah, how you encode these things as real numbers, as Geordie was saying yesterday, is actually really important. And some networks work better than others, depending on the style of input. Yeah, maybe three is either Boolean or natural or reals. Those, those are your sort of. Sort of yeah, I think you shouldn't. You should be able to encode a polynomial. You could, but then you have to ask you: Do I want to encode my polynomial as say? But polynomial is just naturals, really. It's like the space or of polynomials. Should I encode it as roots? By the natural. Or should I encode with roots? They're not necessarily. You know, that's actually like a genuine question. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. And then the other thing which is, is that machine learning tends to ignore, ignore outliers, right? Yeah. You know, so we want to have a diverse data set, but if, if, if your counterexamples to your conjecture are sparse amongst that, then you know, machine learning will just ignore that. And it won't tell you that it's ignoring that. You know. OK, nonetheless, I do think it's kind of a useful um, and interesting set of methods. Um, I, yeah, OK, so what I, I, my time is basically up. Um, uh, there are some, let me just say one more thing. Um, we, we've been trying to push this to, to do new stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I won't go into that. It's going to be too long. But the, just one thing that I think is worth saying is like, um, uh, also another cautionary tale, which um, is trying to understand the Jones polynomial. So the Jones polynomial of a knot is very simple to define, but once you define it, you go, I still don't understand it. I don't, no one really, I think it's fair to say, no one really understands what the Jones polynomial is. Um, and in particular, it would be good to relate it to some other areas, say, for example, hyperbolic structures. And so uh, what you can do is you can feed, like, so this has already been done by, by these three authors, which is to feed the hyperbolic invariance of a, of a uh, sorry, feed the Jones polynomial into a neural network and see whether or not it encodes the hyperbolic volume. And uh, this is an output that says that it does, that actually the hyperbolic volume of a, of a knot does seem to be encoded by the Jones polynomial. But, okay, so there's the so-called volume conjecture, which this isn't exactly right. So the volume conjecture says that the hyperbolic volume should be encoded by so-called colored Jones polynomial, which is a bit different. The actual original Jones polynomial does also seem to be encoding the volume, but people 
do not know how. So what we don't know how is how to go from the fact that the neural network says that there's a connection here to what the actual conjecture should be. Right? So this was the bit that required human input and at the moment that's that's open in this case. In fact, that's actually, let me just simply close. That's why we focused on the signature, actually, because we thought we've got a better chance of being able to get through to a theorem at the end of it. Um, that's not to say there are, there are loads, this, this method has thrown up loads of other interesting connections, but they're all uh, hard to really encapsulate into a conjecture. So I think this is like, this is in some sense a, a challenge of the method. So at that point, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.